God, our Savior, has saved us by the laver of regeneration and renovation of the Holy Ghost, whom he hath poured forth upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Words taken from the lesson, St. Paul's letter to Titus, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Over the last few days, in our discussion of the seven ways that His Majesty came at Christmas to procure our salvation, the way of pedagogy, the way of redemption, satisfaction, sacrifice, merit, recapitulation, and the physical way, seven in all, we have learned that it is not wise to adopt only one of these ways without consideration of the others. When one takes up the pedagogical way alone, he ends in Pelagianism. If one takes up the way of redemption or satisfaction by itself, they often end in Protestantism. If one takes up the physical way without reference to others, it is easy to conclude that salvation of man was complete with the Incarnation. Furthermore, when the physical way is pushed too far, it easily tends towards universalism Namely, that sooner or later all men will be saved tends toward modernism as well. Or even what Teilhard de Chardin, who's really an arch-modernist, what he taught, namely, that Christ today is not just Jesus of Nazareth, risen from the dead, but rather a huge, continually evolving being as big as the universe. In other words, the universe is God's body. In this colossal, almost unimaginable being, each of us lives and develops in consciousness like living cells in a huge organism. According to Chardin, at various times, theologians have described this great being as the total Christ, as if our Lord were not complete to begin with. The total Christ, the cosmic Christ, the whole Christ, the universal Christ. At present, many of the cells, individual men, of this Christ body are unaware of their divine calling and are unconscious of the fact that they are already living their lives as part of this cosmic body. They are already divinized. I wonder if that includes Hitler and Stalin and Mao. All the great sinners. For Teilhard, this cosmic body is meant to become fully conscious of itself in every cell of its being in such a way that every cell is also conscious of the whole body's magnificent destiny. The divinization of matter of the whole universe. After all, it's God's body. When this Christ body realizes itself as the divine reality it has always been meant to be, that moment will be what Teilhard calls the Omega Point. That's what happens when you push the physical way of salvation beyond its limits. You end by saying the matter will be divinized, that the universe will become, as it were, the body of God. Now, He believed in a future in which then all will be God. Everything. This is really a combination of Eastern pagan religions and occult principles. Extremely toxic stuff. Occult people, this is why they're always into environmentalism. Because they look upon the universe even physically, as God's body. You think about that. Next time you see these things about environmentalism, where is this coming from? We need to be good stewards, but there's a deeper reason why these things are so powerful at this time. It's a very occult moment in history. Now, before proceeding today, let us refresh ourselves on what we mean by the physical way in which His Majesty comes to save us. It's hinted at in the passage from the Apocalypse where St. John tries to honor the angel. This is Apocalypse 19, verse 10. I fell down before his feet to adore him, and he saith to me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. So, 
This passage tells us something has happened. St. Gregory the Great notes that the veneration offered by St. John was not divine honor or indeed any other that what might lawfully be given. In other words, he was honoring him as we would honor a bishop or a pope or a king. We can bend our knee, left knee, to a prelate. So St. Gregory goes, nevertheless, it was refused by the angel, even though it was legitimate, in consideration of the dignity to which our human nature had been raised by the incarnation of the Son of God. Okay, so since the incarnation happened, the angels will not let us honor them. <laughs> we are in some way equal now because God has divinized in some way our human nature. That's the physical way of salvation. As the fathers say, God became man so that men might become God. Now, in philosophy, it's important to make distinctions, to not fall into error. St. Thomas Aquinas, in a way, teaches us this very basic principle about philosophy. We should never deny, rarely affirm, always distinguish. So a good philosopher never denies, rarely affirms, but always makes a distinction. And that clarifies the matter. Thus, the fathers and doctors like St. Thomas make clear distinctions to avoid falling into error. Now, in regard to the physical way of salvation, they teach that His Majesty took up a single human nature, not humanity in general, as a sort of platonic idea or form. He took up a human nature, nor did He take up humanity in an, as an entire species. Our Lord assumed his human nature from the Virgin Mary. But did not thereby assume each and every other human nature that was made or will be made in the future. If his majesty had done this, each man would have lost his own personality. Which, of course, is erroneous and contrary to how God works. Grace builds on nature without destroying it. So see, Christ our Savior had no human personality. He had a divine personality. He was united to the divine person of the second person of the Trinity, the Holy uh, Son of God. That allowed him to assume another nature without detriment or confusion to his divine person or his divine nature. If he had assumed another human nature that had its own personality, it would have destroyed that personality. Okay, so he only assumed one human nature, a single human nature through the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, second of all, fathers and the doctors, they recognize that the union of nature in God, who is one single unchanging divine nature, is not the same as union of nature in man, who are individuals of the same species. So unity of nature in man as a species must be accomplished in a different way than it's accomplished in God. Namely, by union of will, union of love. Relying on the fathers, Cornelius a Lapid, commenting on John 17, puts it like this. That they may be one as we also are one. That's John 17. How are they going to do this? Namely, they be one in agreement will and spirit just as we are one by nature and by the same divine essence. He's speaking of God there. So that being joined together by one spirit of charity, they may ever follow me and not be divided among themselves by discord, but rather may have the unity of spirit through agreement, which we have through the same essence. So putting in, as it were, words in the mouth of God, you will become like me if you're united in love. So says St. Augustine and St. Ambrose. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas puts it like this. There's a unity of nature. I and the Father are one, John 10, 30. And a unity of love in the Father and the Son, which is a unity of spirit. Both of these unities are found in us, 
not in an equal way, however, but with a certain likeness. The Father and the Son have the same individual nature, while we have the same specific nature. Again, they are one by love, which is not a participated love. This love they have proceeds from them. For the Father and the Son love themselves by the Holy Ghost. We are one by participating in a higher love that is gifted to us from God. St. Thomas. Although that's somewhat elevated, this is basically saying that for us to share in the divinizing effects of Christ's incarnation, what does it require? An act of the will. An act of love. It's not automatic. We will be aware of it when it happens. Unless we're little babies and somebody's making the act of will for us. Thus, the reading today about the regeneration and renovation being washed. So third of all, this is very important what I'm going to tell you. I think most of you know it, but it's best to go over it again and again and again. It's remarkable how the modern thinkers tend to constantly invert or reverse things. They're always inverting things. The fathers are careful to state in their discussion about the physical way of salvation that God assumed our nature. And through that assumption, united in some way humanity, all mankind to himself, making satisfaction, redemption and divinization possible for all. But in the modern times, this motion of God bringing toward himself is reversed. Such that we hear statements like this one. For by his incarnation, the son of God has united himself in some fashion with every man. Now he's going out and he's uniting himself with every man. Notice the reversal. It's not Christ uniting human nature to himself, but rather he's uniting himself with everyone else. This inversion is repeated in another place as follows. By his incarnation, he, the son of God, in a certain way, united himself with each man. And here's a, yet another expression. We are dealing with each man for each one is included in the mystery of the redemption. That's fine. That's true. And with each one, Christ has united himself forever. Christ has united himself forever through this mystery. Note the reversal, which easily tends towards universalism. Christ has united himself forever to each man through his incarnation? Really? Judas? Arius? Muhammad? Christ is united forever with the damned in hell? Very serious. This is the physical way of salvation gone amok. St. Hilary comes to our aid in discussing this precise point. In regard to Christ assuming our nature using St. John's Gospel, and you will be in me, and you in me. He says, you will be in me through your nature, which I have taken on. For in taking on our nature, he took us all on. St. Hilary. So humanity is in God through Christ. Now, on the other hand, when it comes to his saying, Jesus, and I in you. St. Hilary says, I will be in you when you receive my sacrament. For when one receives the body of Christ, Christ is in him. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And so on with the other fathers. They all head in this direction. So in taking our human nature, he divinizes it and he comes to us individually to divinize us. How? Through the sacraments. That is what we have always believed and practiced. 
not the Chardinian idea. Now, let us consider one more modern aberration of the physical way of salvation. From recent times, a certain bishop once wrote in his autobiography toward the end of his life, I have always contended in talking to missionaries that we are not so much to bring Christ to peoples, to the pagans, as we are to bring Christ out of them. To justify this reversal, this inversion of the church's traditional missionary efforts, he belonged to the propaganda of the faith, by the way. He mentions the physical way of salvation. He says, when Christ assumed a human nature, every single human nature in the world was potentially in that human nature of Christ. Now, I certainly appreciate that word, potentially. Thank you for putting that in there, for most modernists do not put it in there. Now, not surprisingly, then, he goes on to conclude that since Christ is already in the pagan and all we do is bring it out of him, you won't be surprised at what you hear next. In the same paragraph, he says, the fullness of truth is like a complete circle of 360 degrees. So think of a color wheel with all the different colors. Every religion in the world has a segment of that truth. The good Hindu the good Buddhist, these are his words, the good Confucianist, the good Muslim are all saved by Christ and not by Buddhism or Islam or Confucianism, but through their, their sacraments, through their prayers, through their asceticism, through their morality, their good life. Where is that coming from? Christ is already in them. Therefore, they've already got the sacraments, the prayers, the asceticism, the morality they need to live a good life. This is an inversion. That's pushing the physical way of salvation too far. And it tends toward universalism. And it tends toward the so-called anonymous Christian, that error promoted by Karl Rahner and company. And this has truly devastated the missionary efforts of the church. The church has been very clear in her magisterial teachings in condemning universalism starting at least since the Second Council of Constantinople. The Council of Florence states this, no one can be saved outside the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. Pope Leo XIII states, those who refuse to enter the church or those who leave it are deprived of heavenly life and are forever separated from it. And what about Boniface VIII? Find this truth in any single religion around the world that you must be united to the Pope to be saved. Where is that truth found anywhere but in the Holy Roman Catholic Church? It is not. In conclusion, let us recognize that all of these errors can be avoided by how? Simply embracing the Holy Mass into which have passed all seven ways of His Majesty's coming to save us. And that is why this Mass is so amazing, so simple yet complex. So the pedagogical way is found in the lessons in the Gospel, as well as in all the actions of the priest. The way of satisfaction insofar as the Mass is acceptable to God, satisfying His justice. Satisfaction is found in the Mass as atonement and reparation for our sins. The way of redemption is present in the Mass since it enables us to enter into God's heavenly court and use the precious body and blood of His Majesty to pay the price, to cancel and reverse the permissions of the devil. Of course, the main thrust of the Mass is its representation of His Majesty's holy sacrifice on Calvary. Here He is both priest and victim. Furthermore, all the graces obtained in and through the Mass are merited by Christ and are distributed to us according to our own merits. The more we put into this Holy Mass, the more we, graces we receive. So we have to work at it. We can merit more graces. Merit's a very big part of the Mass. 
the way of recapitulation is wonderfully found in the Holy Mass in as much as the prayer itself from beginning to end is a summation and a recounting of the life of Christ. Did you know that every single Mass is a recapitulation of the entire life of Christ? Some examples. The Nativity is in the Gloria, the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel, in the Sermon, the Last Supper in the Offertory, the Calvary is that consecration, the resurrection at the Fraxio, the ascension at the blessing. The physical way is most notably present, finally, in Holy Communion, as noted by St. Hilary and others, that they may be one, he says, by partaking of his body in the Eucharist, might become one both with him and amongst themselves. And this truly, corporeally, physically, and substantially, as he is truly one in substance with the Father. For just as the Father is united to the Son in the same divine nature, so are the apostles and all the faithful united with one another in the same substance of the humanity and divinity of Christ when they receive in the Eucharist. Thank you, St. Hilary. This is the physical way present in the church, in the Mass, Holy Communion. Let us then, when attending the Holy Mass, pray that we will come to share more and more in His Majesty's divinity as He has deigned to share in our humanity. Thank you for listening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.